Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. It was a good idea to introduce the moderator of this discussion, as we uh, already heard. Thank you very much to you for the warm welcome as well. Thank you for pointing at a lot of interesting questions, which um, raised expectations uh, for my talk, and it, it will be uh, which I will easily uh, fail to miss. So um, the. Um, the title of my talk is Does History Teach Anything? And um, unfortunately, I have to announce history is an unreliable teacher, at least to me. So what I can hold out uh, is, first of all, not even PowerPoint slides. Second, um, confusion, but however, an informed one. Uh, and uh, the third is, I was told by the Adenauer Foundation to speak rather 30 than 20 minutes. So uh -huh. if you permit, I will try to be not too long, but... Um, I wasn't given any instructions, but so we will be flexible. So it will be flexible, but uh, okay. just, to, just to warn you that, uh, what, uh, what uh, you have to expect. So let's start and uh, let's sum up. At the end of the year, of this anniversary year, it's, it has become clear the winner uh, of the 2014 European Commemoration Contest is 1940. Surprise victory, at least in Germany where the First World War always has been overshadowed by the commemoration of the Second World War. The First World War, however, and particularly with the question of war guilt, has been a matter of controversial debate starting even before the outbreak of the war. As a, as a consequence of a century of extensive research, one might have thought that all documents had been read and every aspect had been discussed. Thus it came as a kind of surprise that Christopher Clarke's book about the sleepwalkers, you are having it in front of you, that Christopher Clarke's book about the sleepwalkers initiated another vigorous debate about the origins of Europe's seminal catastrophe of the 20th century. However, does Christopher Clarke's Leafwalkers mean a final return to Lloyd George's original statement, another famous quote, that the European nations slithered over the brink into the war? Or is there anything new under the sun? In my view, it is. And as I think, it marks a real progress of historiography. For the first time, we truly, at least in Germany, we truly understand the crisis of July 1914 as an international event. When the so-called exclusive German responsibility was discussed for decades, in most cases it was taken merely from a German angle. The same is true for French, British or Rus Russian politics. However, a unilateral or even a bilateral perspective can't be an appropriate approach for a multilateral problem. And so just recently, we have really, really learned to understand much better the interplay of the European actors. We realize that there was not only one blank check, but that there were at least three. The German blank check for Austria to invade Serbia, the French blank check for Russia to stand firm and to risk a war over the Balkans, and the Russian blank check for Serbia, backing it against Austria. Does saying so indicate an apologetic German desire to get rid of historic guilt, as has been assumed sometimes? I can't recognize this to be the bottom line of the debate. Instead, I think, the debate sheds new light on this landmark of European and global history, and it opens a fresh perspective into the July crisis, offering three fundamental insights. The statements of July 1914 were agitated by a collective paranoia. Everybody felt threatened by the other without having the slightest idea that it was the own behavior which could be regarded as a threat on the other side. 
Everybody felt offended and, in fact, acted offensive. Austria gave Serbia an ultimatum it could not fulfill. While Serbia had conducted harsh anti-Austrian politics for a decade, the French government urged the Tsar to stand adamant towards Austria and Germany, and Germany treated the uh, and Germany and treated the Balkans as a predetermined breaking point for a European conflict. Russia started general mobilization. <coughs> And Germany, bereft of the means to conduct the crisis by having written out the blank check to Austria, declared war to Russia and invaded Belgium. Now, the first lesson from this collective autism, prudent politicians put themselves in the other's shoes and try to integrate the other's perspective into the own view instead of making the own perspective absolute. The second one, a local conflict involves the danger of suddenly escalating into an international conflict, getting out of control. And the third one, once the military conflict has begun, it threatens to get out of control and forecasts lapse. When the statesmen let themselves in for war in July 1914, nobody would have expected that kind of war, which started on the 1st of August, a war that grew stiff in the trenches for years and brought to be the downsides of modern technologies. A war that destroyed the European order as well as the global supremacy of Europe. This means politics has to proceed from the worst case, and to, make, to take into account the unpredictable consequences of its acting. Having said this, the meaning for current politics is not far to seek. If we try to apply these insights to the crisis between Russia and the Ukraine, the parallels are obvious. The danger that a regional crisis escalates into an international conflict getting out of control, the danger of unintended consequences of intended action, and the necessity to take into account the Russian perspective. However, what is the Russian perspective? You know, a couple of years ago, Vladimir Putin identified the decline of the Soviet Union as the major geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Obviously, this was not directed towards communism, but towards a Russian-dominated empire. Instead, NATO moved eastward and crossed the former borders not only of the Soviet empire, but more than that of the Soviet Union itself. Even if NATO changed its doctrine, it remained the military alliance of the other side, of the enemy. As Putin said in March 2014, and I quote, we have been betrayed again and again. Decisions have been taken behind our back. We have been presented with fait accompli. They've permanently, permanently tried to force us into a corner, end of quote. And finally, Putin felt humiliated when Western media jived at the enactment of the Winter Olympic Games at Sochi. Humiliation longs for satisfaction, and the Crimea's old Russian territory, carried over to the Ukraine by the Ukrainian Khrushchev for widely reasons in 1945. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, it became a foreign country for Russia, and in 2014 it manifested its desire to come home to Russia with its 96% majority. If the unilateral declaration of independence of the Kosovo was not against international law, the same should be true for the Crimea. So much for the Russian view, and taking into account it is a token of that kind of prudence which had been missing in 1914. Considering the Russian perspective, not to risk an improvident conflict carrying the risk of uncontrolled escalation, 
and unimagined, and unimagined consequences. This is Realpolitik applying what we think to have learned as the lessons of 1914. Unfortunately, this is only one of the lessons the anniversaries of 2014 are teaching us. Another one is the lesson of 1939, or perhaps more precisely, of more 1938. Let's look at the German demand to annex the Sudetenland, which are the northwestern part, or were the northwestern parts of Czechoslovakia, inhabited by three million German-speaking people who had belonged to the Austrian Empire through 1918. The patterns of the conflict have been strikingly similar. A national or ethnic minority, Germans in the Sudetenland, Russians in the Crimea. A national or ethnic minority demands for self-determination towards the majority society and for the connection with the so-called mother country. Violent conflicts do erupt. Cries for help are sent to the mother country which threatens with a military invasion. And finally, the territory is separated and given either to Germany or to Russia. Munich has, been the has become the epitome of this kind of politics, since as far as national and ethnic arguments could be applied, France and Britain complied with Germany in order to avoid a great war. They exacted the Anschluss of Austria in March 1938. They concluded the Munich Agreement permitting Nazi Germany's annexation of the Sudetenland in September. And they even tolerated the suppression of the remaining Czechoslovakia in March 1939 without taking any military countermeasure. From a French and from a British perspective, there was much reason in the strategy to avoid a war at any price. Both France and Great Britain had much more to lose from a war than to gain from it. However, appeasement, as I say, has become the epitome of a kind of politics which have missed to contain expansionist politics at the right time. Thus, the history of 1939 teaches not to tolerate expansionist politics and to put a timely stop to it. And you will have realized this is rather the reverse of the lessons of 1914. Anyway, nobody knows where Putin's final objectives will lead. And at the same time, identifying equal patterns of conflicting does not mean to equate Putin with Hitler. However, what Putin does is to disregard the integrity and the right of self-determination of a sovereign state. And the experience of the right of self-determination being suppressed by great, great powers acting under the law of the jungle, this has become part of the DNA of the Poles, the Czechs, the Hungarians, or the Baltic states. And this leads us to the third anniversary of 2014. Since 1989 and 1990, witnessed the revolution in East Central Europe, the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and the creation of a new order. One question has been increasingly discussed in the most recent past. The question whether the, mess, the West missed to create a new post-Cold War order, including Russia. Mikhail Gorbachev repeatedly complained that the West had broken its pledge not to extend NATO to the East, which has been a serious allegation. So let's have a look to the document. When the wall came down in November 1989, the Kremlin was definitely opposed to any German reunification. 
And when Helmut Kohl had submitted his 10 points program, pointing the direction towards reunification on the 28th of November, <coughs> Russian uh, Soviet foreign minister, uh, foreign minister Edward Shevardnadze was foaming with rage and shouted at German foreign minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher, not even Hitler would have ventured to do so. Which, in terms of historic, historic, historiographical precision, is not an entirely accurate statement. However, however, Moscow missed to develop any strategy to get an impact on the tumbling events. Thus, on the 26th of January 1990, Gorbachev decided to accept German reunification under the one condition that a unified Germany shouldn't be member of NATO. Against this backdrop, then, Washington, London, and Bonn started to look for a framework in order to keep a united Germany in NATO, since Germany in NATO was regarded as crucial for Western security. When US Secretary of State James Baker went to Moscow in February, he held out assurances, and I quote, that NATO's jurisdiction would not shift one inch eastward from its present position. End of quote. What Baker claimed afterwards, and there is some credibility in it, what Baker claimed afterwards that he had merely been talking about the statues of a unified Germany at the intra-German border, German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher went even further. In his conversation with Schiebertnaz, two days later, he said that NATO would not extend to the east. And he meaningfully added that this was meant, and I quote, wholly in general. What Genscher meant by only in general, he had explained to the British Foreign Minister, Minister Douglas Hurd a few days earlier. And I quote, the Russians must have some assurance that if, for example, the Polish government left the Warsaw Pact one day, they would not join NATO the next. End of quote. Baker, and even more Genscher indeed, proactively had suggested concessions. However, they had not submitted binding pledges, particularly since they did not encounter any considerable Soviet reaction. Chivanaz's mere response to Genscher was that he, and I quote, that he believed in all of the minister's words. This expressed a certain confidence indeed, but it did not constitute an even implicit basis further negotiations. At this point of time, the Soviets rejected NATO membership of unity of the United Germany in principle, and thus they didn't show any interest in any Western assurances when they were offered in February. And in fact, the Soviets did not refer to them later in 1990. Instead, the question was left open while the Western positions changed indeed. After the conversations in Moscow in February 1990, <coughs> Bush, and subsequently Kohl, set the course for pursuing a solution including full German NATO membership. The Soviets reacted inconsistently before Gorbachev <coughs> accepted full German NATO membership on the US-Soviet summit in Washington on the 31st of May out of a clear sky and without getting any concessions. Thus again, there was no reliable Western assurance not to extend NATO to the East, which would have been broken afterwards. But even if it had been, even if the West and the Soviet Union would have agreed in 1990 not to extend NATO to the East, let us imagine what this would have meant for Poland or Hungary, Czechoslovakia or the Baltic states. Such an agreement, such an agreement would have meant that NATO and Soviet Union 
or replace it by saying that Germans and Russians would have as, uh, would have decided about how East Central European peoples had to exert their right of self-determination. Nothing else than the trauma of the victims of the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939. After 1989, their first and ultimate objective was to gain security against Russia, and thus they seek access to NATO <coughs> and to the European Union. Assuming that NATO and EU had denied this, I'm sure we would talk about the historic failure of the Western societies today. However, there is a reverse. The Russian feeling that NATO had spread itself out in front of our front door, as Putin put it. And considering of 1990, we have to realize that reordering Europe was more complex than the talk of the need to integrate Russia suggests. Integrating Russia and fulfilling responsibility for the East Central European states marked two different and two conflicting requirements. There was no one clear and satisfying solution. Thus, the post-Cold War order of 1990 couldn't be a unanimous one. It was built on the hegemony of the United States as the only remaining superpower, as well as on the persistence and the extension of Western institutions, NATO and EU. And it worked. We must not underrate the success story of stabilizing East Central Europe, just compared to what happened in Yugoslavia or in the Ukraine after 1990 or today, or compare it to the decline of the East Central European regions leading into authoritarian regimes and outbursts of violence against minorities after 1990. The price Europe had to pay for the, for the order of 1990 and following is the open Russian flag. In 1990, Gorbachev repeatedly insisted nobody must believe that this was a history of winners and losers. Obviously, Gorbachev completely misjudged realities since 1989 was nothing else than a major defeat, of course, not of Russia, but of the Soviet Union, however there was a lot of Russia within the Soviet Union. And it was Putin in particular who tied in with this Russian great power tradition. In this perspective, 1990 indeed marks the fundamental Russian humiliation longing for satisfaction. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the basis for post-Cold War international order. If we look out for a historical analogy, 1990 was a defeat, a historical defeat other than 1918 in Brest-Litovsk, where Germany imposed a hard, victorious peace on Russia, other than 1918, but at the same time other than 1815, when defeated France was reintegrated as a great power on an equal footing. A fitting historical analogy is to be found in the German war between Prussia and Austria in 1866. Austria was defeated, it was spared, it was reduced to the position of a junior partner, and Austria accepted this. The same is true for the Soviet Union, respectively for Russia in and after 1990. The order of 1990 worked as long as Russia was ready to accept the position of a junior partner in world politics. It stopped working when Russia did not accept this position any longer, which increasingly has been the case since 2007. The so-called Putin doctrine claims a Russian responsibility to protect Russians in foreign countries. It claims the rights 
the right to define what is to be regarded as a threat and a reason for intervention. In the end, it demands sovereignty in the post-Soviet territories, which, has been, which had been abandoned by the collapse of the Soviet Union. Thus, Russia is renegotiating or revising the post-Cold War order of 1990, and is doing so by disregarding the principles of arbitration as they are firmly implemented in the EU, for example. It is acting unilaterally and by the use of force. So, in order to come to an end, back to my original question. Is there any lesson history and the three anniversaries of 2014 do teach us? I promise to confuse you, and I hope I did so. The finding is that the lessons of 1914 and the, 19th of, or the, and the lessons of 1939 are contradictory, taking into account the other's perspective and avoiding an improvident conflict versus timely and resolute containment of expansionist politics. There are no clear lessons from history. And this possibly is the real lesson from history. There is no un ambiguity. History is inconclusive. History provides evidence for probabilities and eventualities, but it does not prescribe or replace decisions in the present present is on its own. Please forgive me if this sounds disappointing to you, but perhaps there is a more fundamental meaning in it. So let's have a last glance at the July Creek crisis of 1914, where we find three patterns of perception on every side. The fatalism that war would come in any case, the idea that it was the 11th hour and that it was better to act now than too late. In the end, it was the belief in the inevitability and the demand for clarity which promoted the outbreak of the war. If, this is a, if you understand this as a case for muddled through, which it is, it did not avoid the Second World War and Auschwitz, it did not avoid Srebrenica and Rwanda, where the international powers stood aloof, while the intervention in Somalia, however, ended up in a disaster. As I said before, no clarity still. Thus, my conclusion is a plea for combination, and I again ask you to forgive me if historians end up always in a very balanced manner. But however, my conclusion is a plea for a combination. Standing firm in matters of principle, which particularly means preventing genocide as far as it is possible, just look at the answer, and refusing the law of the jungle. And beyond that, relying on prudent muddled through, carefully considering means and ends, and taking into account the other's perspectives had the sleepwalkers in 1914 embarked on unsexy muddle through, instead of leaping in the dark, nobody knows what would have happened. In any case, they would have avoided the European catastrophe, and we would have to talk about different anniversaries. Thank you for your attention.